Hope you all are enjoying your lunch or almost finished enjoying your lunch and welcome back to the afternoon part of the conference, second day. I think, you know, we've had, I think, a really stimulating morning uh, listening to a whole lot of perspectives on higher education, where we should go, the sorts of things we have to bear in mind. And I'm really excited to introduce the second half of the program this afternoon with our keynote speaker. So my name, for you who don't know, is Linda Franklin. I'm the CEO of Colleges Ontario. And it's really my pleasure to introduce Ian Shugart, our next speaker. So I think we've spent a lot of time over the past two days talking about uh, the underlying issue of skills and the economy, how post-secondary education addresses the skills shortage, where we go from here to address those needs. And I don't think this is a new topic for us. I think for some time now, a whole lot of groups have been talking about the upcoming skills shortage as baby boomers retire, as our economy changes, and certainly Rick Miner that uh, Rob McIsaac referenced in his speaking points this morning went further in talking about people without jobs, jobs without people, not just that there will be jobs that are going begging because we don't have the skilled workers to fill those jobs, but also if we don't take care in our post-secondary education system, we'll have a whole lot of people who are permanently unemployable because they don't have the right skills for those jobs. And what a terrible reality that would be to live in, where there are all sorts of jobs going begging and all sorts of people who can't find employment. So I think the recession put this discussion off for a short time, but in some sectors this is already a reality. There are already jobs out there that are begging for trained workers. And at the same time, youth unemployment is at an all-time high. So clearly this is a challenge we all have to confront. It's partly the challenge for post-secondary education, it's partly the challenge for business, it's certainly a challenge for government. Because the consequences of not addressing this challenge successfully are serious. Given that reality, I think this conference is very timely and particularly the perspective of our keynote speaker. Ian Shugart, in his role as Deputy Minister of Human Resources and Skills Development for the federal government, is right in the middle of this challenge and I can think of no one better suited for the job. He has a long and distinguished career in the public service, including serving as the Deputy Minister of Environment and Senior Assistant Deputy Minister of Health. He has also served on the political side of the government as an advisor to ministers and leaders of the opposition. Finally, he's played key roles in the international health arena as chair of the Global Health Security Action Group and of the Health Task Force of Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. He's also served on the board of the World Health Organization. I can think of no one better suited to be in this critical role in government at this moment in time and no one better suited to bring to this conference a very clear perspective on this issue facing government today and all of us in this room. Like you, I'm really looking forward to his perspective. So ladies and gentlemen, Ian Shugart. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Linda. It's uh, good to be uh, here. I'd, I'd like you to um, keep on uh, eating. Um, I'd rather have you eating it than throwing it. Um, <clears throat> well, I've had some, um, <clears throat> a few uh, reports of, now I can't remember which glass I brought up. <laughs> Has anybody drunk out of the other one? Because actually that's all that matters. The unintended consequences of my actions. Thank you very much. Um, and mine. You see, now what has just been enacted here is a discussion about data. There's lots of data available, but there's only one question that is important, and that is which glass has been used? And the solution that we came up with was to provide more data. <laughs> I'll come back to that. As uh, someone who has worked in science-based uh, departments and someone who um, was involved in the leadership of one of the uh, granting councils, I am particularly attuned to the importance of higher education. 
and we all share that conviction in this, uh, in this room yesterday and today. Certainly the value of education is understood and appreciated by those who are funding it, by those who are providing it, by those who are pursuing it, by those who are using it. I think we need to think in these days about those who are none of those things. And that is both a sociological question, a question of equity, and a question of efficiency, and a question of opportunity. And I'm going to touch on some of those things today. All orders of, of government are investing literally billions of dollars, public money, in higher education. They're funding institutions, they're investing in educational infrastructure, they're supporting individuals through student financial assistance, and so on. Parents who pay taxes are investing, aside from the taxes they pay in their children's education. Often, after owning a home, uh, education is the single largest expense that families will undertake. And students themselves are doubling down on education, and we know of the concerns about uh, student debt and, and obligations, financial obligations. Enrollments are up to record levels and they continue to rise steadily. In 2010-11, HRSDC distributed $2.2 billion in Canada student loans and more than $630 million in Canada student grants. And in addition, we're seeing more than ever before families pre-funding their children's education through uh, registered education savings plans. Almost 300,000 students last year took money out of an RESP to help pay for school. This is all good news, and it shows up in the results that Canada now leads the world in many, many measures of educational attainment. Although those of us who watch these things see that we slip in some areas uh, even while we have overall maintained our enviable position. Over half of Canadians age 15 and over have completed post-secondary education. These are among the highest rates in the world and that is, that is good news. This collective commitment to uh, education is paying dividends in the labour market and it will continue to. Canada currently has the highest labour market participation rate and the lowest incidence of long-term unemployment in the G7. We're still feeling, of course, the after-effects of the recession and the stubborn uh, slowness of the recovery, not in Canada alone, but in all of the industrial economies. And unemployment rates have yet fully to recover, particularly for youth. We have steady employment growth, and our labour market has shown considerable flexibility and resilience. And it is generating good jobs that are highly skilled and well paid. 72% of total employment growth between 1990 and 2010 was in occupations that require post-secondary education. <coughs> I'm not today going to uh, show you a lot of, um, of data because uh, evidence shows that charts um, prevent uh, um, good digestion, and, uh, but there are key um, data points along the way and the labour market outcomes of post-secondary education is one of the key ones. But we all know that behind these good news and positive statistics are real challenges both for individuals and for the country. Students are investing and focusing more than ever before, statistically, on education. But are they making good decisions? Even in asking that question, I think some will say, well, 
who are you to say whether or not they're making good decisions and good decisions by what standard and according to what criteria? And I don't want to get too picky about it, but I think the question is a valid one. Are the decisions optimal for students? All things considered. Are they going to get the payoffs that they think they're going to get from investing in an education? Are they getting the information they need to make informed and rational decisions? And are they getting the best return on the investment, public and individual, in uh, education? And is society getting the return on investment that it needs and deserves? And I think these are valid questions which in a kind of an overview I'm going to address to some degree. Canada's central challenge in connecting learning to earnings, the theme of this conference, over the next decade is going to be reconciling the importance of a highly skilled and flexible workforce to economic and social well-being against the reality of global economic uncertainty. Like many other developed countries today, the Canadian economy is changing in ways that will make skills <clears throat> matter more than ever before. And the presentation that Kevin Lynch uh, began uh, with yesterday, uh, I think, made that point to all of you. One phenomenon, of course, is demographics. In the not-too-distant future, there will be fewer young Canadians available to take over from the previous generation. For the next 30 years, this slowing labor force growth is going to strain our ability to generate economic growth. Labor market productivity in the Canadian experience has been almost, uh, it's certainly been primarily a result of labor force growth. And that asset is about to disappear. Population aging will require more graduates and better skills and productivity will become increasingly important. Canadians, employers, educators will need to work smarter to see the prosperity that an expanding workforce guaranteed for so many years. That's demographics. The next is globalization. Changes in the global marketplace are generating shifts in how and where goods and increasingly services are produced. Whole economies are changing, sometimes deliberately, sometimes accidentally. The United Kingdom turned in a very, very short period of time from a, an industrial manufacturing economy to one that is substantially a service economy. And this has pushed some low-skilled, low-wage work out of Canada and into emerging economies. But many of these same economies are fast developing high-skilled workers of their own. Think about India and telephony. You will not find landlines anywhere in India. Well, not, not anywhere. But that technology has just been leapfrogged to a whole new generation of technology. And that represents the economic model for many emerging economies. These countries will be competing for global investment and for global talent, including Canadian talent. Now, this will open up new markets for Canada if Canadian firms are nimble enough to find their niche in global supply chains. I don't know how many of you have uh, noticed in the paper and the news today the, one of the effects of the earthquake last weekend in British Columbia, that the hot springs of Haida Gwaii have dried up because of seismic shift in the Earth's crust. These hot springs have been there for centuries. Nobody knows how long they have been there, and in the space of a week, they're gone. Well, there are seismic economic trends happening in the globe, and we can no longer take for granted that the productivity hot springs are going to be available to us as economy and society, or to individual Canadians and young people in particular. And another one of those forces is technology. The nature of work itself is going to continue to change as technology raises the skill requirements of jobs and will continue to transform the labor market and the economy. It will eliminate old jobs in existing industries. It will create new 
jobs and new kinds of jobs. The demographic trend is going to create new requirements for jobs and technology will combine with that to create new kinds of jobs. It will change the way work is organized and put a premium on how people navigate the workplace. And it will do this continually and probably at a pace that will be very challenging. And we are in tough economic times that impose certain fiscal realities and shape the nature and the priority of investments. All of this means that we're going to have to be innovative. We cannot take certain things for granted that have been the basis for shaping the system that we have now. It's going to challenge how we develop the skills we need as an economy and as a society more broadly and how we use the skills that we develop. Already we can think about skills that are in demand today. Even in the tough economy of today, with high youth unemployment, employers in some regions and some sectors say that they cannot find workers with the skills they need, raising concerns about jobs going unfilled in the short term. Last year, as one indicator of this phenomenon, the number of foreign workers requested by employers was 227,000, more or less, up from 157,000 in 2006. Moreover, in a recent survey, 29% of Canadian employers said that labour shortages were so severe that they are prevented from growing as quickly as they would like and as, w as quickly as they could. But at the same time, there are concerns about whether there will be enough skilled workers in the medium to long term to support growth and to seize economic opportunities as they arise. Now, some degree of imbalance between skilled workers and skilled requirements in the labor market is inevitable. And the economists would assert that some of that mismatch is actually the evidence of a healthy economy. But the adjustment process can be slow, and when the degree of those mismatches gets beyond a certain point, we can expect lower, slower economic growth and missed opportunity. And I cite again the phrase that Rick Miner coined about jobs without people and people without jobs. Some of our key indicators spell out this paradox. There are approximately 1.4 million unemployed workers in Canada. We would all agree, too many. But last year, in 60 of 140 occupational groupings, there were more job vacancies than unemployed people looking for work in a given occupation. Employers are reporting shortages of workers in occupations like skilled trades and in a number of technical and professional occupations. Shortages, for example, very evident in the natural resources sector. Oil and gas, which everybody knows about, mining, which is a little below the surface. <laughs> but I'm hearing this about in, in forestry and in other uh, in service sectors as well. And through all ranges of the, of the skills spectrum. It's particularly evident in Western and Northern Canada, but it is also a phenomenon in places, spots all across the country, even in high unemployment areas. So that's skills shortages today. What about skills demands in the future? We're going to need to balance the short-term needs of employers for all types of workers and the long-term need of the country for a well-educated, adaptable and flexible workforce to contribute to maintaining and raising Canada's standards of living. Meeting the skill needs of the future will require progressively increasing educational attainment. Over the past two decades, labour market outcomes have been better for individuals with higher levels of education. Our highly educated workers have much higher un employment rates, lower unemployment rates, as well as significantly higher earnings compared to those with lower levels of education. 
Earnings premiums for post-secondary graduates relative to high school graduates have persisted, suggesting that demand has kept pace with or even exceeded the very rapid increase in numbers of graduates over the past two decades. Even during the recession, the Canadian economy continued to create jobs that required university education, approximately 90,000 new jobs between October 2008 and July 2009 while shedding great numbers of jobs requiring high school graduation or less. About 242,000 jobs shed between October 2008 and July 2009. On balance, what is known about the past and what can be predicted about the future suggests that these trends are likely to be sustained. Two-thirds of all job openings between 2010 and 2020 are forecast to require post-secondary education. Canada will benefit from improved learning outcomes across the population and at all <coughs> levels of achievement. But it's not just more of the same education that we need to be thinking about. The mix and nature of skills in demand is changing. The workforce needs to acquire the mix of skills that will best move the economy towards future needs. And I would venture to say it's not just about the workforce. Society, more broadly, will require the same mix of skills. While high school completion and post-secondary education pays off on average, some fields of study pay off more than others, or seem to. And one notices that the premium, the wage premium, in some countries, Canada versus the United States, for example, the payoff is even more obvious. For example, science, technology, engineering, math, health and commerce graduates have better labor market outcomes than others do, and they experience more rapid transitions into the labor market. Now, I know that some of you are getting ready to look around for a remaining role and see if you can heave it at me. I am not going to get into the debate between STEM and non-STEM. I would simply assert that the Canadian economy, not one type of skill over the other, not one kind of discipline over the other, the Canadian economy needs more of these particular kinds of skills given the nature of economic growth and what I've been saying about global competition and the role of technology. In addition, <clears throat> youth and adults already in the labor force need to acquire the skill sets that will pay off in a labor market with a potential for sh sudden shifts in demand. And this gets into the question of ongoing education or retraining or mid-career training. Changes in technology and relative prices will move the location of production around the globe. All while digital technologies change the skill sets required even of existing jobs. And as a result, acquiring the skills for tomorrow also means acquiring the foundational and technical skills needed to transition effectively from unemployment to jobs and from lower to higher wage employment. But these learning needs seem not to have translated efficiently into the learning system. There is work to be done in this area by groups such as the Council, which has sponsored this conference by the groups represented in this room, by governments, by the private sector, and by students themselves. Most of all, we need to bring these perspectives closer together in meaningful collaboration and interaction. If we can't find a way to help grow our population of skilled workers in line with demand in the future, many Canadians are going to miss out and the country will suffer as a result. Now, part of this need in the labor market is to expand opportunities for those who are not uh, currently in the labor market and to expand opportunities for those who are in training. How do we go about ensuring that graduates from Canada's colleges, career colleges, the polytechnics, the universities have the skills that they need to change to succeed? in this changing world? How do we make sure that graduates have the grounding they require as they embark on careers that begin in today's economy but will stretch out over several decades? 
How do we equip students with the specific skills they need to enter the labor market, but also with broad transferable skills, literacy, numeracy, communication, working in teams, problem solving, and so on, that they will require as they move from job to job and indeed career to career over the course of their lives. This is an enormous task. Nobody can say for sure what the future will hold. And today's data may not be particularly helpful for tomorrow's challenges in all respects. But we need to proceed, even though the environment is uncertain. Key to addressing our skills challenge is increasing the number of available skilled workers. Those least likely to attend post-secondary training in general, or to go on to university or um, advanced college programs in particular, include those whose parents have not been in post-secondary education. Those from rural communities, Aboriginal Canadians, and those from some uh, groups of new Canadians. For those dropping out of high school or failing to attend or complete post-secondary education, factors are often deeply embedded, as we know, in identity, in culture, in readiness, in attitude, in all of those soft dimensions. This is particularly true for Canada's Aboriginal population, but true for many other populations as well. And part of what my department does is to address some of these um, problems underrepresented in the Canadian labor force, whether it is the Opportunities Fund for Disabled Persons or programs targeting the upgrading of Aboriginal Canadians. There are a number of things going on in our training institutions that help in this regard. I was uh, in the uh, spring, early summer, visiting the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology they, I met with some Aboriginal students and learned about the, uh, the kind of upgrading and bridging programs that allow them to make a success of their training experience when they, when they get into it. And these, these bridges, of course, have to put down footings both in the campus as well as in their home communities. <laughs> Many of our institutions have, have made specific provision for providing that kind of, of bridging or that kind of opportunity for Aboriginal Canadians. And that needs to continue, it needs to expand, it needs to apply to uh, other groups as well. Now, connecting learning to earning and the reality of the labour market. We need to think innovatively how we can integrate these two more effectively. And the reality of fiscal pressures is that we, this will be all the more important. First of all, colleges, polytechnics, universities, and employers need to reinforce the ties that bring them together in preparing graduates for today's and tomorrow's economy. And students require reliable, user-friendly access to information that can help them plan their studies and skills upgrading. On the issue of these institutions coming together, clearly colleges and universities are already working with employers, but there's a lot of variation across the spectrum, and more of that has to happen, and that isn't the fault of any particular sector, but more of it has to happen. And we have to think and think very deliberately about how to make it happen. There are mechanisms in our institutions for connecting employers with those developing curriculum and those providing uh, the training. That isn't happening probably as, as broadly as it needs to happen. Some are more effective than others, but this is, a, this is an area where there has been payoff and we know that we can focus in that area and do a better job. It wouldn't be right to suggest that short-term employment needs should dictate everything that colleges and universities teach. And I don't, I don't think anybody is suggesting that. This need not be a binary proposition. But too often, 
And I know that Kevin Lynch would say that, that uh, two anecdotes doesn't constitute data. But too often, we hear of graduates who don't feel prepared for the real world of work, and too often we hear from employers who say that they are not getting graduates who have the mix of skills uh, that they need. And these are not always exclusively technical skills. Well, better linkages between employers and educational institutions can help address this. This could include more innovation with work integrated learning and co-ops, learning delivery that's better tailored to the demands of the workplace, better links between the K-12 system, the post-secondary system, and the workplace, and more collaboration in curriculum and program design. And then we need to take what works, demonstrate that it has in fact worked, and implement it on a wider scale. And that's going to mean that institutions must be willing to reallocate resources when necessary, which is one of the most difficult things to do in large institutions. But if we are going to be a nimble country, if we are going to have a private sector that is nimble, the feeding institutions of that labor market are going to have to be nimble as well. And then information that makes a difference. The more information that we can provide students about the outcomes they can expect from their studies, the better they will be able to make choices. Now, not all information is helpful, and information is not the answer to everything. But if we don't have information, we know that that is a rate-limiting step in the decisions that people make. Those individual right choices, and let's remember at the end of the day, this is a free society and individuals will make their choices and they will make them on the basis of many inputs. But individual right choices, when they're added up, help support Canada's prosperity and the well-being of Canadian society. At the same time, good information on learner outcomes can help the learning institutions refine their own programming and support governments as we develop labour market policies and allocate scarce resources. There was a time when post-secondary institutions collected very little information on the outcomes of their graduates and made still less use of this information and made less of it available to prospective students. Those days need to end because the whole world is moving into open domain and uh, we're doing that in statistical agencies around the world, we're doing that in access to information in public institutions, this domain is no different and indeed is more critical than many for this to happen. We, um, we hear of studies and of surveys and all of this is good. There is administrative data that could be mined to help us know what is going on. The private sector has to play in this. I think students need answers to five basic questions. Why is education important and what kind of education? What should I study? What kind of job will I get if I study certain kinds of things? Then where should I study and how am I going to pay for it? And helping students answer those questions is where we should be concentrating from the perspective of students. Wages are an important consideration, but there are other uh, kinds of employment outcomes that need to be taken into account. And there are other less tangible outcomes on how programs and courses of study are going to prepare graduates to contribute to their communities as well as to the labor market. It would be helpful to know more about the labor market outcomes of graduating students, to know more about where they're working, their current job, what they're earning, what skills and knowledge were most critical to their success in the labor market, and to know from employers the mirror image of those questions. We need to find ways to get this information into the hands of prospective students so that students can make those informed decisions that we were talking about. And the challenge that we face, particularly those working in colleges and universities, is not just collecting and publishing information. 
It's publishing it in ways that make a difference. It's actually publishing the right things. And we don't have the luxury of just collecting data on everything. We've got to think about what are the right questions. I think we need to take advantage of social media to put these and sometimes to push this kind of, of data and knowledge into the hands of those that need it. Educational institutions and governments around the world are experimenting with this and we can pick up on best practice and extend it. HRSDC is working hard in this area. We have a couple of um, internet-based programs, the Working in Canada website and the Can Learn uh, website, which correspond to our labor market and our learning uh, programs. Notice that we've built them to correspond to our labor market and our learning programs, and that itself needs to change as we think about these things being more integrated. Canadians are using these sites in record numbers. We find that the number of visitors to our working in Canada doubles every year. And we, of course, provide information on the funding side of, of uh, post-secondary education. Meeting the fast evolving needs of information consumers and keeping pace with changing communication technologies may prove to be our biggest challenge. If there's one thing we've learned from research, it's that we need to look further upstream in the decision making process to reach students and parents early, helping make the transition from high school to college and university more seamless. A number of universities and, and colleges, polytechnics, are offering programs where high school students can take courses that count towards their high school and post-secondary credits. Post-secondary education becomes a tangible reality for those students. And we do need to address the cultural resistance to some of the science opportunities that, that we encounter. Last week I was at the the Gairdner Awards, which is a kind of a Canadian uh, international um, prize in, in medical research, and it is the best predictor in the world of who are going to go on to be Nobel Prize winners. And the, the winners of these prizes spent time in Canada at the high school level speaking to students about science. We need more of that kind of, of thing. Most of us are also familiar with the introductory and enrichment courses offered by training institutions to secondary school students. These courses help students make an easier transition to university. And if we then add to that the engagement of employers to know what we should be providing at the transition from training to the workplace, that same germ of an idea will expand. For those at the greatest risk of dropping out of school and not continuing, earlier and more intensive support is needed. This is really hard to do, but we have examples like Pathways to Education, which combines a set of services that cross many jurisdictions and boundaries. It can be expensive on a per-student basis, but the payoff is enormous. So we need to be investing across the sociological, range of issues and the economic uh, issues. We need to be doing it with data and we need to be doing it with collaboration. We, we have talked a lot about these issues and we have made progress, but the demands of the Canadian economy and the global economy are such and the ongoing desire to build a fruitful and free and engaging society means that we have to double down on all of these areas. Thank you very much.